Um, let's turn a little bit to, uh, to, to reconstruction. I mean, I, I, my, uh, understanding of reconstruction, um, came so much from, from, from your work and from Eric Foners, uh, Mm -hmm. and, but the idea of it being the, the second American revolution, as you call it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, in many respects, I, I liken it to like, uh, Yavna for, for Judaism, like the rabbinic sure. Judaism that we practice today that everybody perceives as Judaism is actually sort of like version two. Right. And in many respects, the America, the founding fathers that we have today were the ones who basically constructed, uh, you know, the 14th Amendment and 13th and 15th, but the 14th. And under what is the importance of understanding, of coming to that understanding? Well, first of all, I love the, the, the Jewish or Hebrew prophetic analogy here, because it is, it is the one Douglas used so much. Uh, the temple ha- was destroyed. The, t- the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, as the prophet said, because it had to be. The people had become so corrupt, so hopelessly poisoned by their own venality and hubris and all the rest. The temple was going to be destroyed, and they were going to go into exile, and they may or may not find their way back. That's the great story of Exodus, right? Well, uh, Douglas will interpret the Civil War in many ways through that lens, not exclusively, but in, and so did so many other Americans, for that matter. The Civil War in Reconstruction is the destruction of the first American republic. And you don't need Frederick Douglass to tell you that. I mean, he, he does tell you that a thousand times over. But Lincoln argued the same thing. What's the argument of the Gettysburg Address? Well, that short, you know, most well-known American speech, if people just look at it. There's Lincoln standing in that cemetery and saying, um, the four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on, the, on this continent a new nation. But he's saying that nation has is being destroyed right here we're burying the results of that destruction and we have to imagine a new one now he didn't have that all figured out yet but he did actually use the word equality in that speech he drew that off the declaration of independence um now douglas and many others saw the civil war as this reckoning that destroyed that first slaveholding republic of 80 some years. It did it in horrible bloodshed, but they found a way to argue that that was necessary bloodshed. That's an easy thing to say, not an easy thing to reap and to do. But out of it came this responsibility, at least among the leadership of that Republican party that had been founded back in the 1850s to resist the future of slavery and they did. And they took respon- the leadership anyway, took responsibility for the freedom of these four million slaves and for answering the question, now who are they? What are they? The 13th Amendment says, before the war ever ends, slavery shall never exist. Any kind of involuntary servitude can never exist. The 14th Amendment, the most important of all, especially with Section 1, is the Equal Protection Clause. It's the Equality Before Law Clause. It's the Birthright Citizenship Clause. It's the Equality Clause of our Constitution. And the 15th, of course, is the Voting Rights Amendment, 1869-1870, which didn't go as far as the radicals like Douglas would have wanted because it didn't prevent qualifications, tests of all kinds. But there it was now, the right to vote at least for Black men. This was a new constitution. This was defining the American Republic now in a, in a wholly new way, a new inclusive way. It's saying it's being founded now on some degree of equality between the races, the ethnicities, the religions. And Douglas was right at the heart of this. This was Douglas's whole argument about what this Armageddon had been all about. And for about four, five to six years, depending on where you're standing, they reinvented the United States. But every great rev- and it's a revolution. Let's face it. What are you know? There are different kinds of revolutions, aren't there? But every revolution <coughs> always foments a counter-revolution. I mean, if it's important enough, there will be a reaction. 
And how we've seen this again and again and again. Well, what is Trumpism? But in some ways, a counter revolution against uh, the Obama presidency and against uh, liberalism and against uh, so many of the great changes of the 1960s. Even, even the so-called Reagan revolution, which now gets viewed in sepia tones. The Reagan revolution was a revolution against the 60s. It was against civil rights. It was against feminism. It was against all the rights movements. Anyway, the first great counter-revolution in American history was the white South's ability to revive under the reformed Democratic Party and through the uses of terror and violence, the worst levels of it we've ever seen in our history, um, the ability of the white South to revive in the 1870s to take back control of their state governments, what they called Southern redemption, and then ultimately to defeat the reconstruction governments and the reconstruction laws and measures, and especially to defeat black suffrage, black voting, brought about eventually, essentially, uh, an end to reconstruction around 1877 and into the 1880s. And it made possible, it didn't happen overnight by any means, but it made possible the evolution then of a, of a system of first de facto and then de jure uh, segregation of the races, eventually into this elaborate system of Jim Crow laws uh, and, and, and an American system in effect of racial apartheid. Um, so and that counter revolution lasted well. I mean, it lasted in that form for decades. Yeah, uh, seventy years or so. It's uh, yeah, it depends on when you date its beginning. I mean, the real the real Jim Crow system, at least in law, begins in the eighteen nineties. I mean, eighteen nineties the first uh, overt disfranchisement law passed by Mississippi. But by about by 1900 and especially by 1910, all of the ex-Confederate states have become completely Jim Crow societies. And so have other sections of the country, by the way, including in the North. And a part of this process all along has been extremely overt uses of discrimination and extremely overt uses of the denial of the right to vote of voter fraud and extremely brutal uses of terrorist violence. We, I just, the other day, we had a, a Susan Mettler on who was talking about Wilmington, which I had never, uh, was not aware, yeah. uh, which was, uh, you know, horrific. And we, you know, we- 98, yeah. That's I just awesome. reviewed a new book on that by uh, uh, David Zuccino. It's coming out in the New York Review of Books. It's, it's incredible. Uh, yeah, it's a story Americans need to know better because it really was a, it was a white supremacist coup d'etat that took over the state of North Carolina, where an interracial coalition had held on quite well, thank you, in the 1890s. And black politicians were getting elected, especially in eastern yes. North Carolina around Wilmington for years. In fact, the, o the only remaining black congressman in the United States at that point was from Wilmington, North Carolina. But the white supremacists of North Carolina got organized in, in 1898 and ran a, um, a, a and, and, and they were so overt compared to today's vote suppressors and white supremacists. Would that our vote suppressors today were as honest as they were back then, although they're getting more and more on. They're beginning to say out loud the things they think. I, I mean, well, one of the things that, you know, you, you I think you've you've argued in, in your in your books is this notion of the civil war the shooting war ended but the yeah. the in many respects the 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 fundamentals of what were driving that war has not and you know i think back to just that that notion of an ongoing counter revolution and an ongoing revolution yeah. and those moments where the revolution wins out seem very very narrow yeah. in terms of time Right. And then there's these long stretches because I'm quite convinced that you could draw a line from the Voting Rights Act in 65 to the Supreme Court in 2013. Oh, yeah. Uh, gutting Section 5. Right. And that is that is an uninterrupted sort of slow moving process. And we are still in that sort of that process now. 
And it's, you know, when we talk about, I mean, just this past week, the, the, the implications of the 13th and 14th and 15th amendments, when you look at what's going on in Florida, the disenfranchisement right. of, of, of felons, of felons and then yeah. with the use of a poll tax, right. I mean, that is a mirror. I mean, that is like a, just a, almost like a tracing of what was going on 150 years ago in the sort of post reconstruction era. Well, that's very well put Sam. And I've said this in many places in print that, you know, we, we live with the legacies of reconstruction around it around us every day. Uh, if, if, for one thing, my lawyer friends tell me that close to two thirds of all litigation in American courts at one point or another come around to 14th Amendment litigation. Uh, we are forever debating what equality before the law actually means uh, in, in courts. Let's not forget Bush v. Gore, five to four, when the Supreme Coach Court chose our president, argued it on the basis of equal protection of, under the 14th Amendment for the state of Florida. I mean, and on and on we could go. Gay rights, on the, gay marriage, on the other hand, from a different perspective, was a 14th Amendment decision. It was equality before the law. And John Roberts said, uh, yeah, I guess they're right. <laughs> um, uh, so it's all around us. And then you take the, the, uh, take the, the issue of federalism. My goodness, we don't talk about that enough. We, we have a states' rights Supreme Court right now, and it's about to get even more so, uh, perhaps. Um, I mean, Clarence Thomas is the most states' rights uh, Supreme Court justice since uh, some, one of those Southerners in the late 19th century, which is so weird, but it's true. Uh, what is the proper relationship of federal power to state power? It's an eternal question in America. Now, the Civil War had a gigantic row over that right and we had you know that people had a right some people northerners who had won that war had a right in say 1870 to think that you know states rights had been really pretty well crushed here in the blood of antietam or gettysburg but no 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 not at all the the supreme court even with all of the members appointed by republican presidents by 1883 is going to basically wipe out the 14th Amendment in the famous civil rights cases of 1883 and say that, no, no, this discrimination issue, whether it's a hotel or a train or wherever, it can only be settled at the state level. <laughs> you know, which basically said, you know, the 14th Amendment doesn't mean anything. Anyway, Again and again. You mentioned and again. Reagan. I mean, that's how Reagan launched his general campaign after the Republican exactly. convention was at the uh, Neshoba County Fair talking about states' rights. Exactly. Uh, and he went after unions, remember? He crushed uh, the air traffic control unions and then other unions. Uh, and, you know, the anti-union movement in this country, the, the so-called right-to-work laws, are... <laughs> Are the uses, I mean, let's face it, the right wing in America has been very effective at using the language of the 14th Amendment, the language of equality to fight against those very achievements in equality yes. for women and, and black and brown and immigrant people and so on. They're very adept at that, to say the least. Um, can I ask so, you one, one, one final question that's a little bit sort of like tangential, but I, the, the post office. Obviously, yeah. playing a very big role in in all these questions about you know voting right now, um, the post office like this is another example of and I, and I think you know you, your work has sort of taught me more about the concept of history uh, in, in many oh, respects than actual. And, That's the point and, of doing history to just help us understand why it's so important. Well, honestly, like that. Why it's all around us. I, 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 I lament that it, it took me this long to sort of like understand that, but I guess it's You're doing very right well. At it. You're doing very well. At it. But, but the post office is also another issue that like there was so much fighting in the, the it was the radical Republicans who, you know, it was sort of like a, a gave birth uh, to this notion of, of the post office and its uh, ubiquitiness, I guess. Yeah. And, and we're still, it's still a, a, a contention on some yeah. level. You know, I, it's given me a renewed joy when I walk into a post office. You know, uh, sometimes it's a, you know, it's boring. It's something you have to do. You got to get some stamps. You got to mail something. 
but by God, it's a democratic institution. You know, it's, 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 it's one place almost all of us use. Now, not as much anymore because of FedEx and the internet and Amazon, but even Amazon uses it. <laughs> um, you know, the, po the postal service guys deliver Amazon packages all day, every day. Um, so, yeah, and an attack on that is just yet another way. Let's be honest about this. Higher voter turnout serves one of America's political parties. Lower voter turnout serves another of America's political parties. And the one wanting lower voter turnout has, is doing everything it can possibly do to depress, to suppress the turnout of Americans to vote. They are doing it because they've seen the demographics and the demographics have scared the hell out of them. One third of all the votes cast this election will be cast by African Americans, Asian Americans, and Hispanic Americans. And those numbers are growing like crazy every year. The number of vote, the voter turnout among young people in 2018 was unprecedented. Uh, Republicans, given the fact that they have become essentially the white people's party, are in trouble. They're, they're fighting against they're colliding with modernity again. And they're against most of the great changes of modernity. They can't even bring themselves to believe in climate change, um, you know, until they get burned in a forest, I guess. So we're living in the post office, it became this visible example. Do you remember when, uh, when um, oh, the delivery service had a strike? Uh, UPS. Uh, UPS, sorry. You know, those guys won their strike that year because people love UPS, it turns out. They love having things delivered by UPS. And people got behind them because they were a service that people tended to rely on and even love. The UPS guy in his brown shorts walks up, he's your friend. So, you know, there, there's a sense in which the right in America is fighting against uh, modernity itself. Now they win sometimes because they can uh, manage the rules and sometimes they win because of ideology in some cases. Um, but they're up against a demographic phenomenon that is not on their side. So they're in, I have a new piece coming out in, uh, actually it's in Die Zeit, the German weekly. Uh, they asked me to write a a fairly long historical piece on voter suppression, the history of voter suppression. And that's coming out, I think, next week. It's just amazing the, 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 the measures, the methods that Republicans have turned to. And by the way, the template for that is Reconstruction too. I, I mean, there are all kinds of things that, that, that were methods that were used to keep black people from voting. Actually in Reconstruction though, they ultimately just used guns. Well, uh, David Blight, um, I can't tell you um, how how much I appreciate your coming on. Um, uh, we will put a link uh, to Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom on Majority.fm, and also a link to your um, your audio course that oh, you, uh, uh, on on the Civil War, which covers uh, re Reconstruction and, of course, um, the sort of the post Reconstruction era. It, it's it's been such an like important work in in my understanding of so many things i i can't tell you how much i appreciate you coming on well thanks so much sam thanks for having me i, I should update that lecture series sometime because the jokes are getting old i think well they still work they still fly it was <laughs> but i appreciate it thanks so all much right. all right folks we're gonna take a um, little break here and head to uh the fun half of the program this marks the end of the first half of the program. Um, just a reminder, your support uh, makes this show possible. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. Uh, when you do, you support the free show and you get X content in the fun half, which is actually technically not, is even more than half. It's really, it's really like a fun, like 125% or 150% of the show. I don't know how to articulate that in the fun, fun one and a half, half. I don't know. 
Uh, but yeah, I know that's strange. Nomi's looking at me. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> um, but uh, it's true. It is true. Don't forget also amquickie.com. Uh, you can uh, get uh, seven minute uh, worth of headlines every morning on your podcast. It's out by 8 a.m. usually, and uh, check that out. Also, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY. Get 10% off. Get the MR blend. And we have the Carpenter Pencils and the uh, I'm Losing a Bro t-shirts. Wait, is it I'm Losing? What? Oh, no, the Posit t-shirts are in the uh, the merch shop at shop.majorityreport.com. <laughs> Brendan, just put a thumbs up on the uh, pause. <laughs> I like that. You just uh, found and- that. <laughs> <laughs> no, me. what's happening on your show today at three? Oh, I should also remind you, uh, I will send out a uh, tweet and, um, and maybe on the app, a little uh, indication. I'm probably going to be streaming the uh, debate on Twitch tonight. Not 100% sure, but I will, I will let you know. Uh, Nomi, what's happening on your show at 3 p.m. today? 3 p.m. today Eastern, uh, we have Wendell Potter on to talk about the ACA uh, and what is at risk with the Supreme Court uh, nominee likely moving forward. And the Democrats just like, mm, yeah, you know, I can't do anything, can't post, you know, we know the jam. Um, and then we have a panel with Napoleon de Legend and Josh Potish, who everyone knows from Twitter, but he worked on my campaign. So I love to see uh, folks kind of grow into their own Josh activism. Potter. and. He is, um, he's been covering the protests and he, on Twitter, just remarkably well, he sort of owned this space of collecting footage and amplifying it and, um, and he's blown up and it's, it's, it's been great, great content. So I'm gonna... sure we've played some of his stuff actually. Without yeah. a doubt. Without a doubt. He's great. Um, he's a rising, a rising star. Fantastic. That's at, uh, the Nomi Key Show, uh, YouTube slash the Nomi Key Show. I have to actually give, <laughs> I'm really bad at promoting. Clearly, so YouTube slash the Nomi Key Show, and folks can check our uh, our or the podcast description for a link to your show too. Oh, thank Never, you. You know, we, you know, we always keep Very it nice. right there, and people can find it. They don't have to rely on my uh, pronunciation of of your first name. I, I wrote it. Did you see what I did? Oh I my! Can't God. believe it's taken me this long to do that. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, also. Um, uh, don't forget, check out the Antifada at uh, patreon.com slash the Antifada. Jamie's got uh, new content up there. Multiple, multiple, multitudes of new content. Matt, what's happening on TMBS tonight? Uh, tonight on TMBS, we're going to do a members only pregame show uh, where Gene Bajalan will stop by. He's going to talk to us about a conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, we'll also do. I read about that. Fine. That's Far blowing fine. up now. Yeah, so he's going to give us the down low on that. Uh, and then we'll, we're also going to be covering the debates uh, later in the evening. So, uh, and the Michael Brooks Show YouTube channel, check that out. Um, all right, we're going to take a uh, quick break, head into the fun half of the program. See you in, oh, geez, I just saw this. Uh, New York City's positive rate is over 3% for the first yeah. time in months. Uh, not good, folks. Not good. Um, oh yeah.